so important and we've got nothing there right now. Yeah, I think it's clear that everyone has this vision that just having your hands work is an end goal for VR input, but it's not clear what the sweet spots are along from here to there, and that's a long ways away. Uh, I do think that there is a thing that's called hand presence when you feel like your hands are really there in VR, and it probably is sort of a terrifying amount of precision and tracking. You know, it is kind of interesting how VR was originally gloves and goggles, and nobody talks about gloves anymore. It's like, it's like that was probably not one of the right ideas, but it was looked at as so critical at that point 20 years ago, but now it's, you know, it's almost overlooked. I'll also add that in like a lot of the, the uh, testing that we've done with input, uh, you know, kind of like how it surprised us how accurate you have to be with the head to make it really good. The same is true for the hands, uh, not just for uh, immediately apparent errors, like even if it looks like it's working right, having any kind of latency makes it feel like your hand is dead or reacting <laughs> incorrectly, and that's actually a very unpleasant feeling. Um, and then you can easily tell if you do something like clap and then you, you feel, you, you know, you can feel yourself clapping, but then the vision side lags. And now there's a it's really important obvious. aspect to that that's also not real obvious, where so many of the things that we're doing with latency, with time warp and things like that, are not going to help with that visual effect of something coming in there. That needs to run through the whole pipeline. Because it has to process the entire thing, and these hands may be moving in different ways across, you know, another scene that we're also warping. Yeah, so, so do we wind up making, cutting some new path in there for some actual late rendering of geometry rather than just warping for something else that needs to to be sub 20 milliseconds interaction on that, which we can't do for any other general purpose aspect right now. And it's not just that the timing has to be right. I mean, I don't know if you were there, Palmer, but these people all saw the McGurk effect. And the thing about the McGurk effect is not that the audio and the video showed up at the same time. It's that what your brain did with them was something different than it would have done with either of them independently. And similarly, when you clap and you hear this, it's not just that the sound and the feel show up and the visual show up all at the same time. It's that your brain actually takes them and makes an experience out of them that is more vivid and more real. And uh, you know, if the latency is off, it's just not going to fuse that way, and you're not going to have that experience. Well, talking about clapping, actually, what, you know, we talked a lot about audio and the importance of audio for great VR, as you know, Brendan's keynote this morning. What do you guys think you know, improvements need to be made there, and what sort of impact does audio have on the experience on the whole? I mean, we still have this argument internally at the company about like how many people are going to wear headphones versus not wear headphones on Gear VR or what they're going to do in different VR stuff. And you know, the, one of the points that I made was just troll YouTube for Rift stuff on how many people didn't put on the headphones. So it's still a hard thing, and I'm super happy that we did decide finally for the integrated audio because if it's not integrated absolutely as a part of it, it's not going to be an important part. I'm hoping now that we do have it integrated on at least one of our product lines going forward that it will get that attention. But as a game developer, you know, to the audio engineers out there, decades have gone by where they've always gotten the short end of the stick, they always get the smallest time slice of the CPU, and, and they don't really get to do the, the things that they want to do, because honestly, we tried them and they, they didn't pan out that much. But I do think that VR is the time that all that audio stuff that everybody always wanted to do and we never thought made the grade for traditional gaming, now it can actually make, you know, make a difference. But it's going to be interesting to see how much of the things from the audio, how much of it is just the head tracking on the positional audio or the interaction of the different things in there. And we don't really know yet. That's something where nobody's built that perfect demo yet. And that is sort of Oculus's responsibility to evangelize this by making the demo that makes it so blatantly obvious to everyone that this is an important aspect. I think it's going to be more than an important aspect. I think it's going to be a force multiplier. And it's, it's illustrative of something that's happened with VR, which is there, there are a lot of technologies that are cool, but they're just not that important, because what would you use them for? So I talked about scene reconstruction, which is a, something there's been a lot of research on. You can take the two million Flickr photos and you can build a model of the Colosseum or whatever. It's amazing and it's cool. What do you do with a model of the Colosseum? But with VR, you want to be in that model of the Colosseum. And similarly, if audio is really good, if it's properly spatialized, if it's properly propagated so that the space of the room you're in feels right, you won't even know why, but the experience will be far, far more real and you'll experience a lot more presence. So up to this point, making audio a lot better would have fairly low incremental returns. But I think with VR, it's going to have huge returns. I think as, as far as evangelism, one of the best ways to evangelize is not just to make the, the gain apparent to every user, because many users it won't be necessarily consciously apparent. Like you said, they may not even realize it, but um, 
this, one of the strongest ways we can evangelize is by forcing people to do the right thing. And putting audio on the headset kind of forces everybody into at least trying to use that. So it makes it the default. The default is using it with good audio, and then they have to consciously try and break that. And I think that there's going to be a lot of people who maybe do consciously move away from that because a lot of people have uh, brand loyalty or they already have uh, audio gear that they may or may not think is better, that may or may not be better. Um, but right now, the whole gaming headphone industry and is... it it's pretty uniformly terrible, and they're all terrible <laughs> in different ways. So if you're an audio designer, having to design for a wide range of differently terrible headsets is a pretty big challenge. And so having a fixed set, high quality audio uh, set of hardware that you can target, I think is going to be a really, really cool thing. Yeah, like I was actually disappointed where Sony's original HMZ T1 had, I thought, you know, a pretty good mechanical design for the integrated audio, but they were such low quality and everybody panned them so much for it. I was afraid that that poisoned the well, that people were going to say, integrated audio, it sucked in this case, therefore, you know, we shouldn't be pursuing that because the market has spoken, they don't want that. And it really doesn't need to suck. A lot of the cost in the audio industry in particular is going to marketing overhead and, you know, getting these things out there, but it doesn't actually cost all of that much to make pretty good audio. Um, if you know, if you're selling it as part of something else, which is, which is pretty cool. Cool. Wait, one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to see if anyone else had anything to say. One mm -hmm. of the things I'm really excited to see is that um, uh, kind of, you know, you were talking earlier about high dynamic, like dynamic brightness mm -hmm. and being able to have this really wide range that you could potentially have at a head-mounted display versus in, in the past on traditional displays. I I think that there could be something kind of similar in audio that makes it useful because uh, it's not just targeting a bunch of different hardware, it's also targeting a lot of different volume levels that are all, that all sound different on different headphones. So normally if you're working on a piece of content where you have really loud explosions and then also ambient sounds, you really have to compress those into a narrower range than reality because most people are not going to have the explosions um, you know, actually at full volume. They'll turn it down so that the loudest things are at a comfortable volume, and then you just wash out all of the stuff that's quieter. But if you know someone has a certain, a certain, uh, they have a certain audio headset, potentially you can make things where you almost have it like a fixed brightness, uh, having having kind of a fixed a fixed volume. Where if you if a game developer wants something to be yeah, louder, like they the actually have to make it louder up at the top of the capabilities of the headset, and then you. That way you know that all the ambient noise is also going to be at the real world level. Right, like how we can do brightness as an absolute scale rather than relative when we can factor out the ambient lighting. And another aspect on audio though, like one of the points that Hook mentioned that I thought was really interesting is that of course you could still use your giant thumping subwoofer there where you just want to cross over on that because that doesn't get spatialized and yep. you'd still want the, you know, the mid and high ranges spatialized properly through the headphones, but you can still have some large physical device moving a lot of air for you at the low end. And subwoofer actually aren't even that expensive. I, I, I was talking with him and I went out and looked for like the cheapest subwoofer mm -hmm. I could find and it was, I don't remember the brand, but it was some terrible no-name 2.1 speaker set where they all light up all blue acrylic and yeah. like, you know, gamer speakers. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was like $50 including shipping for a little sub and two speakers mm -hmm. and so I ordered one and uh, it actually was just, it's pretty cool what you can get for, you know, what must have been a sub that cost, you know, low tens of dollars. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what do you guys think are the most interesting challenges facing virtual reality? This was a common question that came up. And I think most people are interested in either technical or otherwise. I think uh, actually delivering compelling experiences and not making people sick, making, making them really comfortable in VR is uh, the first challenge ahead of us. And I, I believe it's possible. I think we've demonstrated some of that. And, and having a mass market economy of users who desire experiences uh, that are compelling in VR that are, are not things where most people are going to be really unhappy uh, will let it become a much bigger uh, ecosystem and a bigger audience. And I think that is the first real challenge, delivering the hardware capabilities and getting the developers to, to make these experiences. I think one of the things that you know, that becomes more obvious when you try to use VR to convey textual information to read something on it is how bad our optics actually are when you try to cover the whole visual field and, and read something that has high contrast. So the fact that optics is such an awful mess of trade-offs there, and I still think that display technology can wind up helping this by conforming the display to the optics. And even if our resolution didn't change, 
the space that the advancements that we could get by having optics that were really great across the entire field of view and did proper pixel fusion. There's a lot to be gained there on a completely orthogonal axis to the, uh, the raw resolutions or refresh rates of the displays. Nothing from you, Palmer. I already talked about what's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the thing here is, though, that there are half a dozen different axes that VR can get a lot better on. And so to pick one, I mean, I think it, really input is the most immediate one there. Um, and as Ottman says, motion sickness. But um, really pick any one of these areas and say, OK, we don't actually know how to do them, but we know how to make a lot of progress on them in the near future. And so you could say input, you could say audio. You could say display in several ways. Um, hey, depth of field alone, uh, yeah, right? I mean, say. who knows how it would be if we had good depth of field, because we can't even prototype that right now. Um, so, and, and, and tracking. Tracking and computer vision. So is this where I get to say, if you're a computer vision researcher and you want to come work with me, please let me know? Because <laughs> <laughs> tracking everything, tracking your head, your hands, your body, your eyes, your facial expressions, um, making it so that you can get up and walk around safely. I mean, you know, John talked about standing up while you do this. There's only one downside, <laughs> and that's that you might actually just step on something or fall over things. So how do you solve that problem? Um, how do you reach out and pick up real objects? There's this whole constellation of tracking things. So everywhere you look in VR, there's like this great long road of fascinating stuff to figure out. I, I do think that input is one of the, you know, you said there's a half dozen, dozen different paths, but input's one of the more obvious ones, uh, not even because it's most clearly the biggest win compared to you know, audio or walking around or better optics or anything. It's because it's clearly obvious to consumers. It's the type of thing where, yes, you know, great optics across the whole field or conforming displays or having better audio or depth of field, those are all really great, really important things, but they're not immediately apparent to consumers, and they're not gonna, the, the, if, as long as input isn't there, people will say, Where's my hands? And, and th that shows how you can't really separate these, because if you want to do this, you have to have tracking, yes. right? And if you want to, for example, do foveated rendering, you have to have eye tracking. So again, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a reductionist problem. You can't say, I'm just going to fix this one thing. <clears throat> so about <clears throat> excuse me, eye tracking. One of the most common questions that came up for you guys was just about what the future of eye tracking looks like. Why haven't we seen a low cost, low enough latency solution yet? And when can we expect to see something like that integrated into the Rift? So there's two aspects to eye tracking that it could be used for. Using it just to determine depth of field has the simpler aspect where all you need to know is how the pair of eyes are, whether they're you know, straight ahead or converging. And you could determine a depth of field based on not a whole lot of information there and not necessarily having to be particularly fast. It's an interesting question whether that would even be a positive thing, though. In VR, of course, everything is in equal focus. In the real world, things are in variable focus. But is that actually a good thing in the real world? Do we want to uh, you know, even emulate that in VR? And sometimes, like in game rendering, when I see people emulating the negative aspects of film rendering or uh, of film in some way, I wonder the same thing. It's like, do we, should we be happy with VR that is in some ways better than reality with an infinite depth of field uh, or not? But then the more powerful and more important aspect for the eye tracking is how we can do foveated rendering, where right now it's probably not even a good idea. Because if you're only rendering 1K something eye buffers, a lot of current systems will wind up sucking up more in overhead if you make another pass through it to render two views per eye. But there's, you know, there's paths in hardware API interfaces that we can start eventually rendering, push the scene once, get four views out of it exactly how you want to compose it. And when we're at 4K displays, that's going to clearly make good sense to do that. And we want it to go even beyond that. So as Michael pointed out there, what you really want is this incredible 16K by 16K space. And we're not getting that. You can count out how long it's going to take Moore's Law to get there. So clearly, we want foveated running. It seems an easier problem than you know, catching three orders of magnitude or something on all these different improvements. So I'm, I, you know, I'm excited to see some more of this. But yeah, we've got there's a half dozen companies that are pitching stuff there. And as far as we can tell, none of them are really quite usable for our needs yet. Cool. Although, just to add on, there is the other yep. use, which is mm -hmm. just pure, you know, oh, you look at something and it shoots in that direction. Like just a pure mm -hmm. UI yeah. tool, apart from the core mm -hmm. virtual reality experience improvements. Um, and that, that's pretty tough, too, because 
you want to have a solution that can really do everything. You don't want to build it in just as a, U, as a cool UI tool, especially because even the best stuff out there right now, you have to design game. It, it's almost a constraint for your design. Like there's nothing so accurate that you could like look at something and reliably have you know a bullet go right through that point. You could do stuff like intelligent auto aim to know which person you're aiming at. And, and of course, figuring it, out how you do the intentional action. You know, yes. Gate, you know, selection is obvious there, but how do you do action? You know, staring intently is a little bit harder to pull out. <laughs> so you you it ends up almost. That's the murder in their eyes. <laughs> yeah. And it could potentially be a design constraint that actually doesn't doesn't add as much as, as people would think. And it could be better that eye, eye tracking, you know, isn't. It could be that eye tracking isn't worth doing until you can do it really well for all of these things. If you have a lower quality eye tracking, you may be able to drive avatar eyes so that I can see that you're looking at me, you're looking over there. Yeah, potentially. Even with a low quality version. Well, if you want to be in virtual space with another person, the place you start is eyes. We're just incredibly sensitive to that. And there's, there's actually, I forget who did it, but there was a study that was published, it was shown at IEEE VR a couple years back on real, real avatar eye tracking versus simulated eye tracking. And the idea was to try to figure out the intent of the user. You know, if they're looking roughly at, at you, is it probably right? Um, and then if you have two heads that are close together, what if you know, virtually it says, I'm looking at you, but I'm also going to snap the eyes occasionally over to him every once in a while. And I don't know where my eyes are pointing. And to you guys, as long as what I'm doing appears plausible, it's not actually, it doesn't matter if it's actually correct. Um, and then another demo, another part of that was they had a mirror. And if you looked in the mirror, they tried the real eye tracking where it looked at your eyes and pointed them in the mirror. The problem is the eye tracking actually has, you know, all kinds of real problems. Um, like accuracy and then trying to get it in just the right place. Whereas the simulated eye track, and they said, well, if he's looking right in the mirror, let's just point his eyes directly at his eyes in the mirror. And then no matter how you move, it looks like they're just perfectly moving, much faster than you ever could with the entire loop of an eye tracking camera in there. And then if you look somewhere else, like let's say I look, I'm looking at the mirror, but then I move my eyes to look over to the left, then I can't see that my eyes are pointing in the yeah. correct in position anymore. So it, it could lead to some strange stuff, but I think that as long as it's a plausible action, you may be able to get around a lot of the Avatar stuff. Two mirrors would screw you up. Two mirrors would definitely <laughs> screw it up, yes. So going back to input for a second, um, one of the other top questions in terms of technology was around haptics. And just, you know, we haven't seen, well, Palmer, you could speak to this probably better than the, the questions can, but we haven't seen that many advancements in haptics. And how important is haptics for VR? I disagree. I think we're seeing a lot of advancements in haptics. They're not just generally not virtual reality focused. You know, the holy grail is something that uh, can exert force, you know, back on you. You reach out and you hit an object and it actually stops you there. But we don't have any kind of technology like that, at least now on a consumer level, that can simulate a wide variety of things like we can do with the visual or audio system. So you've got approximations where, um, you know, you've got shaking hands and of rumble motors, and then you've got some cooler stuff like LRAs on, and the piezoelectric. So what have you seen on the really high end? Well, the really high end is uh, th they actually do make like many multi-axis, multi-motor arms that actually give you feedback. And these are usually used in very high-end professional simulators, like one that I've seen, it teaches, um, it teaches people who are building aircraft carriers, like how to use welding tools and stuff. And you can actually like run it up against stuff and um, you know, either pound it or draw a fine bead. And it's, it, it's, it's very cool stuff, but like precision electromechanical devices haven't gotten all that much cheaper over the last few decades. Mm -hmm. it's, it's still very expensive. So I'd say that's the most cutting edge, but there's, there's, I haven't, I'm not aware of anyone doing that for consumers really well. I, I think v haptics is very important and very hard, very, very hard. I think what might be more trackable in the medium term is another tracking problem, which is pulling tangible objects into VR. So, I mean, as simple as your coffee mug so you know how to pick it up so you can drink from it. Your keyboard would really be handy, right? Um, but all kinds of objects. And if you do that, you get haptics for free. So that's one way that I think it could be approached in the near term. But haptics is the hardest of the problems as far as I'm concerned. Like if you had a banana and you picked it up and then you could you know, you could, you could have it actually show up in, yeah. in the virtual space. Now you have a banana, and yeah. then maybe, you know, you cut it apart, and it's still a banana. Then you've got this great haptic eating feedback. <laughs> That's how we're going to simulate go. uh, taste. That's right. <laughs> That's a hard tracking problem, though. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Need those computer vision engineers if they're in the audience. 
I just so, want to, one more thing. One of the first things that we were doing when we started doing position tracking was we, we had like, you know, the little cubes floating around and we were just going around pretending to eat them and we're like, wow, that could, because you can't see it once it goes here. We're like, it all, no, that, that's almost something that you could, that could be a gameplay mechanic. <laughs> ER Pac-Man or something. <laughs> There's a game waiting to happen there. It's like eating bubbles because you can't, you know, you can't really taste them or feel them. Okay. Getting away from bubbles. <laughs> Can the panel discuss their thoughts a bit on the prospects and challenges of social VR? So we actually, in the last six months, we took a little quick stab with Gear VR to try to get in the basic social aspects of getting vo uh, voice communication and getting a trivial avatar body with head and eyes and the, the basic stuff there. And we just we couldn't get enough done in enough time to make it part of the, the shipping experience, but of the couple things that are the top flight most important things as we go post-launch, getting that multi-user experience there is, uh, is our most important sort of user visible feature. So it's clearly a hugely important thing, and I think it's oddly somewhat under... It's a little surprising that more hasn't been done in the VR community so far. I mean, yes, there's a number of things that are neat that people, people have done, but that it's not a more core mechanic, uh, it was a little surprising. And I guess as the basics mature and people understand how to do the general thing about moving your view around, I expect something, you know, more of that to be going on. Although there was, you know, there was an interesting thing that uh, Mark Zuckerberg mentioned when we were talking about that, about how much interaction winds up not being synchronous, but instead asynchronous, the whole leaving a note for someone and interacting with people in ways that don't necessarily have all those critical real-time interactions about keeping the eye tracking and everything working exactly right. But clearly it's going to be the largest, most important part of VR. I mean, people aren't going to be doing these things completely in isolation. And that's been one of the interesting differences between playing games and that what people actually do in real life. Like what people do in real life, there are people who go, you know, hiking all on their own or, or you know, taking pictures all on their own. But for, I think most people participate in activities along with other people. And sometimes that can make even really kind of terrible, boring activities really interesting because of the whole social interaction aspect. Like I don't think Checkers is a very good game. Um, I mean, it, it's, a sol it's a very simple game, it's a solved game, you can actually memorize the set of ways to win, and then it's not even a game anymore, it's just who goes first. And despite that, people still play together, because it's not the checkers that engages people, it's the human dynamic and, you know, being on the other side of someone that you're trying to, to outwit. And I think that bringing that into virtual reality can be more powerful than just, than just the kind of multiplayer gaming that you normally have, which is, you know, people are talking on voice chat, but for most games, you're effectively on your own. You know, you're, you're running around the map on your own, or you're moving with other people, but you don't intuitively know that's a person that's actually right next to me, and we're doing this thing together, so. Yeah, and that should be one of the real, you know, okay, the first major challenge for VR is don't get sick, but one of the next major ones is going to be that sense of empathy, you know, when you can really relate to the person as an actual person, and that's going to be a really big deal. I mean, that's one of those large-scale social issues, but I have seen some, some kickback from some people that are like, don't talk to me about social and multi-user and VR, I want my virtual world, so there's, there is, I. Uh, you know, there is an element like that that really wants to make sure that they can have the world to themselves. Maybe we can connect all those people. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just like dump them into a box. <laughs> the antisocial box. Okay, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> all good. Do either of you guys want to comment? I already said what I thought about this. Sure. Which is, I think this is the biggest thing that's going to happen in VR. Palmer said it better than I can. All right. <laughs> the box? <laughs> <laughs> so I know that this panel is uh, the future of VR, but w another one of the most common questions asked was, what's your guys' latest take on augmented reality? I as think much as we feel free to talk about here on this panel. I, I think augmented reality is someday going to be very important. I mean... John and I were talking about this earlier, and John said, hey, I want that information all the time, and you know, once it's there, people will want it. I think augmented reality is harder to do well than VR is. VR is clearly trackable at this point. It's not clear to me that augmented reality is trackable to an extent that would make it genuinely useful yet. I mean, one of the accomplishments that I pat myself on the back for is talking Michael out of AR into VR. <laughs> <laughs> I give John full credit for that one. 
well, like you said, there's a, you know, that VR is clearly tractable versus AR. And I'd say that, the, not really disagreeing, but there are clearly things we will be able to do in AR, like additive AR, where you put things over the environment in some, some general way. But the things you really want to be able to do with AR, you need to be able to subtract from the environment as well and bring virtual elements in in a really cool way. You know, that, that's how you can do all the cool things, like putting people who aren't there in the real space or erasing the people you don't like or you know, real, <laughs> or, or real world ad block. But as long as, as long as the state of the art is just adding more glowing information to the world, it's not going to be able to do what Well, that's going to be the interesting thing is, does it wind up that pass-through winds up being the way that AR actually works in the end? You know, if we get our, you know, our, our in-goal VR sunglasses in some way and we have planoptic light field cameras lining the front of it there, then that might be the path. We might back into the path that solves AR more than a lot of the complicated optical directions that things are going to now. And that certainly would be fascinating mm -hmm. if it ended up being that that was the better visual path than going for an optically transparent system and then trying to solve all the problems with yeah. that. Uh, particularly if, like you said earlier, there's some things in VR that potentially we don't even want to emulate. It would mm -hmm. be very interesting if you don't just get AR benefits, but you also get real-world benefits. Yeah, you get things your superpowers. Like you want your telescopic and microscopic vision that you can turn vision. on on will. Yeah. Also, and if you build up a good enough database of all the objects around you, you can have kind of kind of a proto x-ray vision where you mm -hmm. can see through walls, you know, through to, oh, I see the path goes over the hotel through that wall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Be interesting. <laughs> Hang on a second, everybody. <laughs> Picking the next question here. An another question that came through actually a lot was, do we think that perfect VR, which is indistinguishable from reality, will be attainable in our lifetime? And obviously, we've talked about some of the, the biggest barriers, but that, that was sort of the follow-up. What are the biggest barriers? Well, you know, indistinguishable from real life, one point that I, I sometimes bring up when we're talking about how precise optical distortion has to be to be right is that you can be real life suffering various levels of artifacts. You know, if you're looking out a car windshield or through a screen door, you're perceiving reality in the real world, but not necessarily at the peak fidelity under the best of conditions. And I think that it has been, you know, it's been rewarding to watch real-time rendering get to the point over the last couple decades where now there are, even in real-time, some things with limited cases where you can say, this looks, this is photorealistic, it's indistinguishable. And the offline rendering now is just getting crazy hard to distinguish between real and false there. But I... Um, so I think that it always winds up being this set of conditions, like we went through all of this in gaming, where you can take your simplest cases where you've got a room made of nothing but diffuse reflectors and uh, rectilinear surfaces, and you start really simple, and you say, okay, we can nail this to some level, but the, you know, the vibrant rainforest jungle in a rainstorm or something is going to be way, way, way harder to get there. So it's not a bright, sharp line that you cross and you're done. It's something that, it's a huge spectrum that you slowly creep over. And I think that, like, the ability to say something, a, a system, it's, I guess it's almost like a Turing test that you take at that point of real versus synthetic, but the idea of having a head-mounted display, and if you were given the option of actually taking the lenses out and viewing a real world <coughs> through it versus having the lenses in and seeing a synthetic world, or not taking, leaving, making the lenses non-distorting so they were still seeing through glass, that type of test where I suspect that within a decade, in, a sim you know, in simple, contrived cases, or your Cornell box of virtual reality, that we probably will be able to do something that could be visually indistinguishable, that could fit under the, uh, the response thresholds of perceptibility, that might be missing something much more important that not aware of. But for the simplest cases, it's probably possible. I'd be curious to see if I, you'd agree with so that. So I agree about the visuals. I also think it should be possible with audio. I also think it's possible with smell, and if it hadn't been for smell -o vision you know, smell would be a less uh, amusing topic. But, I mean, let's face it, we've got something that's right next to your nose, and it only takes a few thousand molecules. And but isn't it, the isn't it the case with olfactory and taste that uh, there's no way to synthesize that, where there's no additive combination like Correct. RGB or waveforms? As far as I know, but so you need a library. it's not an inkjet printer with three heads, let's yeah. just put it that way. <laughs> Maybe a thousand heads. But you don't necessarily have to have all the smells to have, it's just what you're saying with uh, visuals, which is you're not trying to do everything perfectly. The question is, can you do anything really convincingly? But then you get into vestibular, haptics, right? How are you going, kinesthetic, how are you going to do those? And 
It's not going to be a robot arm. I'm pretty confident about that. I mean, that just isn't tractable. It's not going to be some kind of omnidirectional treadmill. So these be, and really the hard one is, how are you going to do vestibular? So right? how are you thinking about neural stim nowadays? <laughs> like neural stim direct neural stimulation or sensing? Uh, are you talking about, like, directly stimulating the vestibular organs, or are you talking about jacking the Anything in matrix? general. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, we'll see the, the parts of sensing, you know, sensing motions directly coming out first, but, the, you know, the different ways of poking at the brain in the, uh, more direct fashions than through our external actuators. <laughs> well, I mean, that'll be interesting to see, but we have to understand how those systems I mean, you're work. You're the one zapping people's uh, <laughs> galvanic. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 I mean, even, you know, galvanic vestibular stimulation is mm -hmm. really kind of, it's kind of a crude trick. It's mm -hmm. not really, uh, you know, we figured it out over a hundred years ago. A guy stuck some wires from a battery in his ears <laughs> and fell over. Uh, that's actually anecdotally <laughs> what happened. Um, and so it's, it's a really crude trick. It's a long way from that to being able to simulate all of the accelerations and movement, much less the vision and the audio that you'd want to have for direct uh, but we are seeing stimulation. exciting things for the, the blind and deaf people that are getting direct oh, neural sure. stimulation on things, but can it be done in a non-destructive way or a way that doesn't require it to be gone in the first place? Well, it's non-destructive and also a quality line. Like, yeah. uh, some, you know, something that, was, uh, that I think you mentioned earlier was that you know, people, if they're not a believer, and they'll try, if they try something that really gives them a sense of presence, then they'll be converted and say this is a thing worth using. Um, even if we can get something working you know, that replaces your eye, even if it's non-invasive, uh, the quality has to be at a certain level. And the level for using that technology is much higher for me or you than for a blind person. Yeah. Because for them, the, almost anything is going to be an improvement. A 10 by 10 grid of pixels is it's great if you huge, had zero yeah. before. You can know when, when it's yeah. morning or night and you, know, you can see some movement, but uh, we have to understand how the system works. And people ask me all the time, you know, when, when are we gonna see neural stimulation? Like, yeah. can we predict it? Or other people say, oh, well, it's clear that there's a path to it. And I don't think that there's any clear path to it. Yeah. It's, but the it, point, it, yeah, the it, point it, I keep coming back to though is it's so painful that the bandwidth of your optic nerve out of your eye is way less than your monitor cable. Yep. And the fact that we have these orders of magnitude more that we need to, to come up through to get this external stimulation and then throw away 99.99% percent of all of it. Well, you, you get into these weird, weird sci-fi scenarios like in, you know, there's a lot of sci-fi where the currency of the future is the drugs that allow for, an, like the anti-rejection drugs <laughs> that allow for implants and stuff. And, uh, you know, we, we still haven't even figured out how to implant basic stuff in people <laughs> without, without using all kinds of complicated medicine to keep them alive and working well. So, We'll see. I kind of think of it the same way. I think of, uh, you know, people talk about reaching the singularity. I think there's people who believe that, you know, it could happen maybe someday. There's people who believe we can prove it will happen someday. And people who think we can, going back to the question, prove it will happen within their lifetimes. And I don't think that for the singularity or for this, that there's a path where we can prove today that it will, that it will happen within our lifetimes. I also want to, you, you mentioned, you know, well, both of you, like, there's all of these different things like the vestibular system and tracking your body and all that, but you, you could probably come up with an artificial scenario where you could simulate not just like a room from the vision side. Like, imagine if the simulation was that you're in a room that has no, no, no movement, no, no sound except yourself breathing and no scent, and you're in a straight jacket, <laughs> really tight straight jacket. Potentially, you could even simulate that experience pretty closely. <laughs> well, I, and the, if you put yourself in an anechoic chamber with the lights off, you can yes. nail that one. <laughs> we win. Oh, right? floating in a tank. Floating. Okay. Yeah. Well, but, but maybe you don't even need the lights off because you're simulating you wearing a VR headset. <laughs> so you, the, the light leakage is it's all part of the sim. But, I mean, the truth of this is that this is kind of on the other side of the divide you talk about a lot, which is that there are things that seem within reach, and those are interesting. There are things that are not within reach, which are interesting to think about, right? There are sort of two different categories. And this one, who knows? What I do think is that as VR becomes more widely used, there'll be more incentive to look into these things. Right now, there isn't really, I mean, there are blind people, so you can help them, but it's not like a billion people are going to start using this technology if you came up with it today. But once VR is widely used, then there's more incentive to do that kind of research. And who knows where it'll lead? I think something that actually is in reach is not perfect VR, even for a limited experience, but an experience that where people just forget that it's VR and they believe it's real. And for that, for that technology and that experience that delivers it, I think that'll be achievable yeah, in our life relatively yeah. soon. Yeah, that's not even that far off. And yeah. cartoon worlds can be 
find things to do for experiences, and you can, the knowing that you can shave many orders of magnitude off the difficulty of the problem by making creative decisions, <coughs> those become pretty valuable. So on the creative front, actually, you know, we have a room full of developers here. What sort of recommendations would you give to everyone actually building content for VR, especially if designing for presence? And I, I would like to point this question at you, Ottman, since you've been <coughs> focused on a lot of the Crescent Bay demos that are here today. Uh, so an interesting thing is that good VR makes computer graphics matter an awful lot. Uh, you have an incredible ability to perceive things in VR that you can't on a 2D monitor, even though there can be a lot more pixels on your 2D monitor. And, and so graphical quality matters, the, you know, using geometry, not using textures, all those things you can really appreciate. Um, the downside of that is that where you cheat and lose, it's really bad. And the uncanny valley is a deep chasm that scares the hell out of me. I mean, I've got you know, much more tactical <laughs> advice around. <laughs> I was looking for some more tactical advice, but. <laughs> you know, around uh, aliasing. And that's the biggest complaint that I have uh, when I look at the VR stuff. And the point about aliasing that might be acceptable on a 2D monitor really isn't in VR. And you need to make trade-offs, even if it's lower resolution, but you need to get a level of anti-aliasing in, which means, you know, you want... MSAA is actually a better deal for VR than it has been for traditional gaming in a lot of ways. You want to be... We default to two on gear, and we, it's nice when you can use four if you're not that aggressive. But then the things that wind up being mistakes that developers make are seeing some things without MIP maps, so then a texture just aliasing horribly, uh, something that's got high enough contrast that you really at least want to be using sRGB, uh, and then presenting text is another one of the, the really common ones where you want to use a, a nice thick text font to be able to, you know, you don't want single pixel risers that are either aliasing or at least going through filtering in different ways as you project them, project them onto the screen. So that's the largely, it's usually a good bet for me when I first try a VR experience. If there's not a ton of aliasing right away, it usually strikes me as certainly a more professional demo, and I tend to enjoy it more. And there have been a few cases when I've seen something that I really did kind of like, even though it had tons of aliasing. And I just want to get the developer and shake them and say, do these things and fix this. <laughs> yeah, John didn't mention this, but part of the reason is that the displays are such low resolution, but the other part is that any aliasing you see is different in your eyes, and so you see stereo disparity where there's aliasing, and you just, you just see all this popping and twinkling that, that's like very distracting. Mm -hmm. yeah. A low-res sparkle. Mm -hmm. No other recommendations. Guys, guys, I thought we'd have some more there. Okay, we'll move on. What do you guys think it would take for VR to actually fail to take off this time? Well, we, we, we usually try to take different planes, right? <laughs> we do. <laughs> no, I mean, that, there's the obvious uh, you know, disaster scenarios in health and, human, health and safety conditions that could happen. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's probably not in, in, our, in our best interest to even really go into what could happen with that. But obviously, if people spontaneously combusted when they were in VR or had some similarly serious health issue, it would kill the industry. And there, you know, there are things that, you know, that, you know, you could trot out and say, I mean, what if there was a developmental problem with small children or something? That would be, that would be a tragic thing. And, you know, there's... You can, we can be as safe and careful as we want, but we're fundamentally doing something new that people, that billions of people have not experienced before, that we don't have this history base to work with. So it's something that, you know, we should be conscious and cognizant of the risks with that. Uh, you know, from a content side, at this point, I, I think we are over the hump and the, it's smooth sailing in terms of getting, uh, getting it out, getting it to a lot of people. There's still a lot of little things that could trip us up that could maybe make Oculus not the one that, you know, that gets overtaken by somebody else. But all, you know, signs look good right now. If it's not something out of left field catastrophic, I, I would be really shocked if five years from now, VR is not a common, broadly used, wildly popular thing. So I'm going to do something that I should know better to do by now which is, I'm going to disagree with John a little, because I don't think content is over that hump yet. I think that we haven't seen the thing that's going to cause people to have to use VR day after day because it's so compelling. And I think, I hope, someone in this room or someone watching is going to be the person who does that first. But while I've seen a lot of cool stuff, I haven't seen that yet. 
So I actually think that I, I would agree with you on the game content side of things, but at this point, I'm enough of a believer that just the digitization and telepresence of the real world is going to be enough to make VR, that will be a, enough of a leg for VR to stand on, even if all the games failed, and they won't. You know, there will be good games and bad games, and things will rise to the top. But if you look at, uh, you know, if you watch grandparents using tablets to look at pictures of their kids, that's going to be magnified tenfold when you see, it's like, can I, you know, when we get the little multi-camera ball that you can sit down there and then grandma can look at her granddaughter's uh, birthday party or whatever, that's going to have this huge broad-based social thing where literally everyone in the world will see something that they'd like to do that is either a telepresence or a pre-recording of a panoramic stuff. I actually think that's enough by itself. And the games are all going to come on and we've got this experimental stuff and we don't know what the right things to do there are yet. But I also have confidence that that's going to get solved. And so I think the, the combination is why I feel really pretty good about it. I also think network effects are going to be a really strong thing. I mean, people still play Team Fortress 2, not because it's necessarily, you know, not to put it down, I've played a lot yeah. of it, but it's not necessarily the best game people could be playing, but it has a huge community of people who have been playing for years. Right, but can we get playing. enough network, you know, enough people yes. into the network on well, VR? And it's like, we're probably, we're not there yet, but we totally probably agree. can be there soon. I mean, if you look in, we, we hope we can get there soon, because if you think about, like, to use a, a close example, Facebook, if you had shown it to somebody and said, do you think that billions of people will use this yeah. tool? If it had been, you know, a, a profile with, you know, a few friends, if you know, you, they weren't your friends, they weren't posting things interesting to you, uh, I don't think many people would have instantly grasped that this was mm -hmm. going to be a huge communication revolution. Uh, virtual reality, if you have a lot of people, you know, sharing experiences in ways that you can't experience any other way, and if you have ways to do things with people that are much more powerful than Skype or, uh, you know, or chatting on a telephone, I think that'll drive people to use it as well. But it's not clear. It's, it's weird. You've got you to gotta get the people before you can keep the people mm -hmm. and vice versa. Cool. So I did want to open it up so that some people here in the audience could ask questions. I think we've got about a little bit less than 15 minutes left. <clears throat> Are there questions from the audience? I think we have microphones up there. I see some people heading towards them right here. Could you give us our, your thoughts on ambulatory VR, specifically you know, walking around, what you guys might be working on, what you think about it? The Oculus Rift is a sitting experience. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. All right, next question. <laughs> What is Oculus's approach to their clear gender gap and how you're gonna not port that into VR? So I will address this carefully. Um, <laughs> I noted that there were some people online, uh, even an article pointing out that, that Oculus Connect is mostly male. I will point out that in the selection process, there were very few women that applied. It was not that we selected for males, and in fact, women may have actually come out ahead in the selection process by a very slight margin. Um, I'm not 100% sure what we can do. You know, it's, this, this isn't a problem with VR. This is something that is widespread in the tech industry, and I don't think that virtual reality has any innate quality that really makes it immediately obvious that we're going to be the thing that has a lot more, you know, women becoming interested in virtual reality and coming to developer conferences or becoming game developers. Then again, I'm not an expert on this issue. I don't really actually know what the best way to solve it. It's not something I'm, it's not something that I'm, that I'm equipped to do. We are having a hard time hiring all the people that we want. It doesn't matter what they look like. Yeah. So I guess we'll just jump around here, so we'll go over there. So all the most compelling experiences in the Crescent Bay demos we just saw are about creating these virtual worlds and putting you somewhere where you're really experiencing like a simulation, whether it's supposed to be realistic or not. But what about all the other things that I do on a computer all day, every day? It doesn't necessarily have to be as real and high fidelity, and yet a VR experience where we have incredible input and incredible feedback loops could that be a way we get people to want to use VR? Even where we can't have them stay on the top of the Eiffel Tower and look down and convince them, yet still browsing Facebook or you know, Twitter or whatever you do on a computer, 
is so much better that you want to put on a headset. All right, so I've spent a fair amount of effort trying to optimize legibility and readability in the VR headsets. Everybody since DK1 has always wanted these virtual desktops, and you know it was, it was a disaster on DK1 with the, the low, with the full persistence and the low resolution. On, it's still not good enough to do on DK2 with 1080p display. It's, you'd be looking at something that's like an original iPhone size. On a 1440 system, you're basically at, you can do something credible in a 1K by 1K space, although it's still a little bit eye straining just because the optics aren't all that great. I think that when we get the next step and we've got 4K display resolution, then you're looking at simulating very large 1080p monitors, which becomes interesting as a desktop replacement, where you could have the you know, potentially portable device that spins up your three 32-inch monitors or whatever they'd wind up being at that resolution around you. And that becomes a genuinely useful productivity tool where you feel cramped on a laptop in a way that you're not used to if you use large monitors, and that will desktop replacement or monitor replacement will be credible on the next generation. It depends next display generation, not necessarily next product generation. Uh, but it will depend to some degree on the quality of the optics. Uh, right now, I, you know, my, my torture test is reading these comic books in virtual reality, and it's something that you know, I'll, I could spend an hour or something doing that, but I'm not sure at this point that I'd want to spend all day long inside the headset for a number of ergonomic and comfort reasons aside from just the visual fidelity. But I do think, not this year, but in years fo following, that is going to be a really big deal. And it may turn out that we sell more VR headsets for these mundane, prosaic uses of them as just a better way to carry all of your productivity rig around with you than necessarily for any of these VR-related aspects. So I think it's, it's definitely not here now, but I can confidently predict it will be important within a couple years. So I agree with all that, but I'll point out you need an input device too, <laughs> right? And so that's the other piece of the equation. How are you going to interact with that fantastic desktop? So and I, what I think you wind up doing there is the, the display should wind up changing so that you have removable light blockers <laughs> as, so that you can actually still look at a keyboard or some other, interactive, some other traditionally interactive things. Because at that point, you're not trying to be immersed in a virtual world. You're trying to use it as a tool to sort of augment your space around you. Alternatively, you could pull your keyboard and mouse into virtual space and track them. Tactile matters for keyboards, you know, no, more no, than no. a lot of things. They're not virtual. It's a yeah. real keyboard. Mm -hmm. Going back to his point before yeah. about... Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you've got tracking for all that, that's a good point. Let's keep moving right here. Hey. So kind of piggybacking off of his question, um, just interested in your thoughts on the future of UI, user interface, um, especially for things that really don't have an analog in the real world. Uh, do you think we're trending towards uh, skeuomorphic kind of interfaces where, you know, like kind of what Make VR does where you pick up a tablet in virtual reality and there's your menu or whatever? Or do you think we're going to have something like projecting a menu onto a 2D plane in front of you, kind of like what Team Fortress 2 does? Or do you think we're going to see a mix of both? I, I don't think there's any obvious reason that the long-term future is skeuomorphic stuff trying to emulate the real world. I mean, it, things like tablets exist because that's the best form factor we can cram the technology and the display into, not because it's what we would have invented if we had free reign to bring anything into this real world. Um, I don't know if it'll necessarily end up being these really fantastical augmented reality movie style interfaces, but uh, it's probably not going to be real world, real world devices brought into the virtual world uh, in the long term. So, but I think one key aspect that I'd like people to think about when they're making VR user interfaces is that the, the real advance of VR over all of the other screens that we look at is that you can change your gaze view. Now, it's a bad idea to make something that forces you to look side to side, but as the glance of gathering information, I've made the comment that touching is the most natural way in the world to affect something, but glancing at something is the most natural way in the world to gather information. So I do think that good VR interfaces wind up, yes, you interact with everything right here, but we need to get away from sort of this safe zone mentality that so many designers have baked into them from all the time working on TVs and monitors, where it is well and good to extend well past the edges of the screen for information that you're going to bring forward around. 
So I think that yeah, the notion about we have these limited boundaries on the physical objects because that's fundamental to their nature, and we shouldn't tie ourselves to that, that we should be able to do some things better. While we have to, to live with these lower resolutions and some of these other things, at least we can take some advantage of the wider field of view. But it's easier to overdo that by requiring people to change their gaze often. I also think that, uh, you know, like tablet interfaces, going back to that again, uh, you, the reason that you tap on them and do these touchscreen motions is because that's what you physically, that's the best you can do with a tablet. There's no reason that you don't have another element there where, you know, the confirmation isn't just touching something, but it's actually some depth. Like, I've seen some interesting ideas where you can pull yourself through screens, not particularly like, you know, grab a handle or anything, but just being able to pull screens towards you and away from you, and that's not something you can do on a tablet. So. Uh, that's, that's another reason that interfaces probably aren't going to be, you know, these, these real-world analogs. I, I, I think we'll see some stuff that takes use of the primary advantage just looking around, but I think the, one of the other ones is, is that you have depth and that you can interact with UI elements that are, that are transparent. Once and, we get and good tracking depth. of all of this yep. stuff. Once we have tracking. Yeah. Over here? So, oh, my gosh. Sorry. <laughs> Back <in>. Whoa! <laughs> Uh, so in the, uh, the Crescent Bay, which was, you know, exhilarating um, and at times terrifying. Um, and just real quick, I don't yes. want anyone to refer too much of the Crescent Bay demos in this room. Oh, so for right. the people that haven't, so we don't, no spoilers, but that's for, fine. Where, where you're going is totally fine. Yeah, um, it just, it brought, it brought to mind uh, the early 90s and the whole Night Trap uh, Mortal Kombat <laughs> fiasco that led to the ESRB. Um, and I was wondering if there were any, any thoughts you guys had with Oculus Share on some sort of self-regulating mechanism to warn people about the nature of experiences to force, you know, to forestall that kind of congressional scrutiny and, uh, and maybe, you know, try to, try to make sure everyone's on the same page with the, the level and depth of experiences that are Say, the, the amount of curation we're going to exert is a fiercely debated topic in <laughs> Oculus. <laughs> I am... So yes, there, there's a lot of strong opinions on uh, the whole spectrum of options there, and right now we really don't know where we're going to wind up. And I don't think that you know, the ESRB is, is interesting, and that it's voluntary, and that people, it, it works for the current game system. But as we start having you know, some kind of metaverse with people hopping between different places, between user-created content and commercial content and fusions of the two, uh, the ESRB probably becomes not the right tool to to, to police something like that. I don't know what the right tool is. Well, you wind up with a lot of games that, uh, that have ESRB levels, especially to the younger kids. It winds up adding a lot of technical limitations for how they have to mediate the communications between users. And those are certainly things that we have enough technical problems. Sure. I'd rather not have artificial ones imposed on us. Well, and also, like re with movie, with movies and games, it's traditionally been you know, is, is it's what they say. What is present in this content? Is it violence? Is it sex? Is it drugs? Is it alcohol? And they check off all these things. But I could see making really terrible, horrible experiences that don't have any of those things, like something that drops you through floors or runs you through walls or has just really scary but not gory monsters. Mm -hmm. It's like you know, we're, we're Virtual reality is a powerful enough medium that you can probably make things that kids shouldn't be playing even without ticking any of those exact checkboxes. It's, 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 it's like was said earlier, you know, I'll know it when I see it is the only way to really gauge that. The man yeah. will keep us down. I think just I want to add one point from the product side. I think we already do some light curation on share today to make sure that the experiences that are going up there are aligned with sort of what we would like to see on share. So if someone does upload something that's completely just out of, completely out of line violent or pornography or something like that, those things don't show up on share. Those are curated out. So I, like, I think, you know, as John said, this is still a, a debated topic inside the company. I think it's too early to say exactly where we'll land on it. But it's a good question. Thank you. Absolutely. Over here. Hey, Josh from TechCrunch. Earlier you said that controllers are the missing link but implied that no one's really nailed it yet. Looking at dual wielding nunchucks, uh, tr motion tracking, and gloves, what are the advantages and disadvantages of those different input devices, and what would you guys say are your favorite? Palmer, Ottman, Michael. I don't, I don't think we got. I mean, that's a that's a huge thing uh, to, to get into. Our favorites. And the <laughs> we have one minute and thirty seconds. <laughs> just, Sorry, just next. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, 
How could you do that to me? Something, Palmer. The, I, what I'll say is that I don't, with virtual reality, you don't just want to have something that's optimized just for being nunchucks or swords. You want also a general purpose you know, utility input device that you can naturally interact with the world with. And unfortunately, what makes a great gun controller is not the same as a great sword controller, is not the same as a great productivity controller or browsing controller. So. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult set of trade-offs to go, to go through, and that's one of the reasons that I don't think we've seen one particularly you know, ideal solution. It's because making a general device for a, for a problem like that is hard. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's important to note that there's a lot of these things that, like, when I saw the low persistence demo for the first time, it, you know, it took seconds. You're like, yes, this is absolutely the right thing to do. We have not had that moment on any input device where, you know, it's clearly the right thing and we all agree and it's powerful. Exactly. So, uh, Greg Roberts with D Sky 9. Sneaking uh, one more in, 30 seconds. All right. <laughs> I want, first want to congratulate you all and thank you for actually bringing the industry to this point. Um, it's really exciting to have seen the history and be here. Ask now. your question. Okay. <laughs> the question is uh, the killer app hasn't been invented, like you said, Michael. So, what is Oculus doing, seeing as your future and all of our futures are depending on that to get out there? What are you doing to really, besides this conference and bring the hardware, to, to seed developers and to allow and enable that killer app to be developed? We're, <laughs> we're making the tools that enable the people to make anything ideally. And if you look at the real world, you know, what's the real world's killer app? I think there's a lot of things. Um, people haven't created it for VR, not because they can't think of it, they can't imagine it. Science fiction's shown lots of great ideas for potential killer apps. But VR hasn't been around that long. This isn't something where people have been actively trying to solve it en masse for decades. I mean, they. In small numbers they have, but you haven't had rooms full of developers all trying to figure out killer apps. Um, as time goes on, I think it's inevitable that someone will, I think there will be lots of killer apps, because if you can make a platform where you can do anything, how sad would it be if nothing is worth doing? It, it, would, be, it would be sad if Oculus made the killer app. I mean, really, that's not what we're supposed to do. I mean, we do have first-party stuff that's being developed. I mean, we developed some of the Gear VR stuff, and there are teams spinning up to do things, but it would be really too bad if we were the only people out of everyone here that hit on the right idea. I, yeah, I'd be, uh, I would be disappointed. I think it's unlikely as well. Yes, I agree. Because, you know, we, we can focus on ideas that we think are really good, and we have a lot of great people thinking about it, but really just through the sheer quantity of people that are tackling the problem outside of Oculus. And, and there are limits even internally. I mean, we have, there are thoughts and gestalts of ways of doing things inside Oculus that are going, that are precluding us from exploring some of the things that might wind up being important. I mean, it's the whole, when you have a, you know, an organization, there is an organizational culture and an organizational way of doing things, and I think that there's a pretty good chance that we might not have the magic solution right now, that it's going to come from something with a different culture and a different way of going about exploring it. On that note, we're going to wrap up. I right after the next question. No. I want to thank you guys all for coming. <laughs> all these four brilliant minds will be here for the rest of the day today, so you can catch up with them, assuming they all come to the cocktail hour this evening and everything like that. We do have, I think, nine developer sessions the rest of the day, starting, I think, in 15 minutes, which is why the next question was just cut. And so we hope you guys go explore those sessions. It's some of the top people from Oculus and third-party developers in the industry who are building VR games and applications. So. Thank you guys again for coming. It's awesome to have you guys here. Thank you.